Uh, Revelation chapter 9. <clears throat> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go off my notes for a second. Huh? Okay. I'm going to go off my notes for a second. Uh, just on the spur of a moment. I just, I just now thought maybe I should, maybe I should do this. Uh, let's just do an overview of what we learned so far in Revelation 9. And I don't know why uh, this chapter in particular just really it comes alive to me. I don't know why I've been drawn to so many things here. Uh, how long have you guys been listening to me? Four or five years? <clears throat> I've mentioned Revelation 9 more than once, haven't I? I would ask people in this church how long they've been listening, but most of them hadn't started yet, so... I need you up there, David. Um, the overview of Revelation 9 is, is we have a number because God does everything in order. And there's no doubt in my mind about it. It's not a random thing that God chose this fifth angel and this event to accompany the fifth angel. Um, the star falling from heaven. He has the key to the bottomless pit. And uh, that's in my notes for this morning, but I'm going to hold off on that for a minute. And then we have um, the uh, locusts coming out, which are a type of a curse. Uh, when God sent the plague of locusts to Egypt, Egypt was not happy about it. They were being plagued by it, and it destroyed everything. But this locust is more than just locust. Uh, they, are, they have scorpion tails. They have um, uh, also all the things that we mentioned here so far. Um, they are like horses prepared unto battle. They have the faces of men, the hair of women. Uh, it means that at least some of them were in the Biden administration. Yeah. And for no other reason than that. That's the only reason. Um, they had breastplates of iron. Their wings were as the sound of chariots and horses running to battle. The tails like in the scorpions, stings in their tails. And the power was to hurt men five months. The five months here, I think, is also relevant as well. But we have this number five here. And remember what I said last, uh, last week. And I've said this before. Um, that when these locusts come out with their scorpion tails and they sting everybody that no one dies for five months they want to die but then no one actually dies for five months um, so I when I think about that um, turn to Isaiah chapter 14 and um, you could probably pray for me this morning. I feel like my, I feel like my head's just rattled for some reason this morning. Uh, I don't know why. But anyway, um, JR, are you up in the booth? Could you get me a bottle of water, please? Thank you. I got a dry mouth and I'm sweating and, and I'm just, I don't know, I can't, I seem to have a hard time to focus this morning. But anyway, in Isaiah 14, uh, in verse 12, we, we get the nature, we understand the nature of Lucifer is that he, um, he uh, will uh, ascend into heaven, verse 13, exalt my throne above the stars of God, sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The sides of the north means the north side. North is where God descended from in Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, beautiful, let's see, what is it? The book of Psalms that talks about Mount Zion in the sides of the north. So we, at least I believe that that is a reference to heaven. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then the last seven words that he speaks here is, I will be like the most high. So, you know, when we look at the devil, and we look at, his patterns and what he does and how he does things. He is a counterfeit God. Everything that God is 
and God does, the devil has a counterfeit. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I'll give you an extra quarter for that later. Um, but anyway, he, he's a counterfeit. Um, God has his Christ. Satan has his anti-Christ. Um, Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Antichrist is um, the goat or a beast of some kind. Um, and in 2 Thessalonians 4, turn there. Or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4. We have God's people getting victory over death. Uh, verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, number one, with a shout, number two, with the voice of the archangel, number three, uh, with the trump of God, number four, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then number five, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, which is where the Lord said he would be coming in. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Um, uh, so we will meet Jesus and the dead in Christ who have risen up. They've conquered death. And so has, if it's going to be us on this day, if we are still alive and remain unto that day, then we, of course, will be conquering death without ever having seen death. And so all of us who have conquered death one way or the other will meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be uh, with the Lord. I was reading uh, this morning about how we conquered death uh, in the scriptures. In that uh, when Christ died and he rose again, he's, was, he is life forevermore. Will Jesus ever have to die again? No. And here again, why is it that Catholicism and even um, the Lutheran Church and others who believe in transubstantiation or consubstantiation believe that they have the ability to crucify Christ afresh every time they perform the Mass? And that's what they're doing. Christ only dies once for the sins for all mankind once and for all that's that's where that phrase comes from it comes from the king james bible once and for all catholicism says that he dies he must die again for just about every sin that's committed so if you were one of these strict catholics and you had the ability you would go to Catholic Mass at the monastery or the convent or wherever at the church every single day. You would go there, you would receive the Eucharist, which they believe is the real presence of Christ, the real body of Christ. You would receive that again and you would participate in a ritual that claims to kill Jesus all over again. I know, Sterling, it's crazy. But these people, they refuse Bible doctrine and they believe every word that their priest tells them to believe. And it's just, it just, it's beyond me why people would think that way. But Christ died once and so when we die, those of us who are in Christ, when we die and we are resurrected, will we ever have to worry about dying again? No. Death will have no more dominion over us. And by the way, not just death, but sin. The, the, the best way to get rid of sin is to get rid of the sinner. Okay? Wipe him off. Get him, get him out of here. Get the old man, let the old man go, and let the new man live. 
But anyway, we have this, this thing, this blessed hope, this glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that when Christ appears in the air, that we're going to see him, or we're going to be ri rise up with him, and we're going to escape death, or if we die before that day happens, we will conquer death, and we will live again forever and ever. So, just to, just to compare the two events, God has his, what we're, what we have used to call, we're used to calling it the rapture. It's, it's the resurrection of the saints, the first resurrection. It is when all those who are dead in Christ rise from the dead, those of us who are alive will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye and will be changed and will not have to die. So the devil has what appears to me his counterfeit. In other words, he's got a plan to transform man so that man doesn't die. Now, why it only lasts five months, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, you know, what happens to everybody at the end of the five months. What I do know is, is that man is working feverishly for the technology, whether it's done by genetics or it's done by technology, uh, merging man with machine, okay? Um, and boy, I've got, I saw something this week in the Bible about that. I don't know if I should talk about it or not. Since my mind is running all over chasing rabbits everywhere, I might end up with that rabbit. Yes, sir. Please do. You heard that I died? Okay. To be absent from the body is to be present from present with the Lord. Okay? Now, uh, if you're asking, and I've had this question asked before too, and I'm sure it's a question in everybody's mind. What happens in the interval between when a person dies and when the resurrection happens? You ever, th ever asked that question? Like somebody, let's say that uh, the people that followed Jesus in the day of Jesus are the people that were saved under Paul's ministry. Okay, they died 1950 years ago. Okay, so their body has been in the grave for 1950 years. So if the Lord comes this year, how does that work with their dead body in the ground for 1950 years? What has their soul been doing all of this time? You ever thought of that? Did you ever come up with a good answer? Okay. I, I think that I think it's like this. Okay. Above this realm that we're living in now, we are bound in this, in this world, in this realm, we're bound by certain laws. Gravity is one of them. Time is another. Okay, we, we, we are bound by time. Everything that we do falls in a certain time. The way we speak, speech is patterned after time. There's present tense words and past tense words and future tense words. And they all denote periods of time. Above this earthly plane is a realm where time does not exist the way we understand it. Okay? It's almost like it's the land without time. So, um, let's say that, okay, my granddaughter passed away in uh, 2000. Of 12 and I have not seen her since then but 
when I die and my soul departs my body, hers will also have departed her body. It's almost worth showing up with Jesus at the same time. Does that make sense? The people in the past are sliding forward. We're sliding toward them, all meeting at the same time in the same place to meet Jesus. Okay? I can't explain it any better than that. So if it doesn't make sense, okay? That's, but that's, that, that's about the best that I can come up with because I don't believe in soul sleep. The Bible does not teach that. It clearly teaches us that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Uh, Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. In other words, he expected that immediately upon his death, when we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus, immediately upon the death of the rich man, he is in hell, lifting up his eyes, being in torments. Immediately, the angels came and picked Lazarus up and carried him to Abraham's bosom. So it was an instantaneous thing, okay? Um, but time operates in a completely different way up there in that realm, okay? And I can't explain it any better than that because I can't fathom it. I can't understand it beyond that. Um, <clears throat> I've got a, a note here uh, describing the pit in Job chapter 10. And it says where the light is as uh, darkness. Well... It's a place where light and dark are the same thing. I don't understand that, but I believe it, okay? So anyway, here's my point in this. I think the devil has a plan to bring all of the lost, wicked, hell-deserving people of the earth who have decided, well, good morning, Judah. Uh-huh, I see you back there. Um, all of the wicked of the world, they want to escape death. And so God is going to give that to them for five months. And for five months, nobody's going to die. That to me is, it represents them or mankind being changed. Mankind being uh, altered. Mankind being born again. Uh, the Peter said being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again of incorruptible seed, the word of God, the Bible. They are going to be born again. There's going to be a transformation of mankind, but it's going to be of corruptible seed. So think about it. God gives his incorruptible word to Adam in the Garden of Eden. And he says, Adam, if you do this, you shall live. Satan comes along and gives corruptible speech to Eve. What happens to Eve because of his corrupt words? Death. For by one man, death, a sin is brought into the world and death by sin. So... Um, in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Since both are green when they're growing up, you can't really tell the difference between wheat and tares while they're just all green in the field. But the moment that the harvest time is ready, at harvest, everything changes. Green apples to red apples. Uh, Hard peaches to soft peaches. Our folks from Georgia brought us some peaches. And Vidalia onions. Woo, doggy. But at harvest, everything is transformed. Everything has changed. The tares turn black. The wheat turns golden like the sun. And so there is, a, there is a change and a transformation that takes place. And it's then that you can clearly see who is and who isn't. Amen? So that's why the Bible tells us uh, not to judge before the time. What does he mean by that? 
He means that we may judge people the wrong way. Um, I mentioned to you when we came back from Kenya uh, this, this past uh, winter that uh, I met a guy at, the, at Nairobi airport. We were headed out and uh, I heard his accent, so I knew he was from England. And I said something about God saved the king or what. He said, amen, mate. You know, and <clears throat> we started talking. Come to find out this guy was doing mission work. Now, this guy had had hair and a, and a ponytail. And he, I don't know, he had a few tattoos and stuff like that. And, um, but he agreed with me on the Bible. I said, I said, let me tell you why I said that. I said, because my my. Bible, the favorite Bible in the whole world, the King James Bible. And I said, it hasn't changed in over 400 years. He said, that's exactly right, mate. You know, and he was excited about it. And I had him judged all wrong, George. Oh, this guy, he's a, some biker idiot or something like that. No, oh, he's a good guy. And we had a great conversation. Had I judged him immediately, right then and there, I would have judged wrongful judgment. But... One of these days, it's going to be very, very clear who's on the Lord's side and who isn't on the Lord's side. Amen? And I think something like this, what's going on in Revelation 9, is part of that. I think this is sort of the devil's, we we'll call it the devil's resurrection. Courtney, help me remember that title for tomorrow when Lindsay asked me what the title is. The devil's resurrection. Because I think that is related to it. I think that's part of it, a big part of it. Now, Revelation 9, 11. They had a king over them, and we'll get to that part a little bit later, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. What did we say Abaddon and Apollyon meant? Destroyer. Let's look at this pit for a minute. There's um, several places where the bottomless pit is mentioned. Revelation eleven seven. 7. The Bible says when they shall have finished their testimony. This is concerning the two witnesses. When they shall have finished their testimony. The beast. And that's, that's something I want you to be prepared for. Um, when we get into chapter 11 next year, is uh, who do you think the two witnesses are? Okay, who do you think they are? And just kind of hold on to that. So I'm giving you an advance warning, like two years notice, to study that out, okay? But anyway, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war. So... We believe then, or at least I believe, that the king, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon and Apollyon, is also the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. And he shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now turn to Revelation 13. I want you to turn there because there's a verse... Uh, something just hit me just now that I want to show you in Revelation 13 concerning Revelation 11, 7. Revelation 13, 1. And, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So the Bible mentions here that the bottomless pit is underneath the sea because the beast rises up out of the bottomless pit. He rises up out of the sea. And once he comes up out of the sea, then he's known that he is, uh, he's got seven heads and 10 horns and 10 crowns and on his head's the name of blasphemy. Uh, also in Revelation 13, uh, let's see here. Look at verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? 
And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. 42 months, that's 6 times 7. That is also um, three and a half years, or uh, as, as some believe, and I think it's probably valid, a time, times, and a dividing of time. So you have a three and a half year length here that uh, power is given unto this beast. And that would be uh, power over the earth. He literally is going to rule over everybody in the earth. I thought about this too this morning. I wish I could remember where I read from because I'd go to it. But I was reading the scriptures again this morning where, I was, where it was talking about how um, once we die, uh, we're not going to die anymore. We're going to have complete victory over death. We're going to have complete victory over sin. And we'll not. once we die, we're not going to have to worry about that anymore. In that same place... The Apostle Paul said, therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. Okay, now think of sin it, because of the way the verse is written. Think of sin as a person. We'll call him Mr. Sin. Okay, that's his name. And actually, we should call him King Sin because that's what he does. He is sin, or as 2 Thessalonians t calls him, the man of sin. He is a, a king in that he reigns over the mortal bodies of people who yield themselves over to the will of Mr. Sin or King Sin. And whatever King Sin tells them to do, that's what they'll do. And it's like they have no power to say no to the lust and the desires of their own flesh. They have no power to turn it down. They have no power to, to walk away from it. It's because there is a king living inside of them called the man of sin, and he is reigning in their mortal bodies. Now, I've made... Um, I've made it quite known, if we go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, and I did mean 2 Thessalonians this time, I have made it known, I still believe this, that the Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition, the beast, all of those good names for him, the destroyer of the Gentiles, um, I believe that he is going to literally reign inside the bodies and the hearts and the minds of everybody on the earth except those who are saved. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the only proper uh, way to define this phrase, temple of God, the only proper way to define it is to say that's the body. Because that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Know you not that your body is the temple of God. And so I absolutely believe that the beast will reign literally in the hearts of all mankind all over the world. And think about it. Remember, we, we're kind of showing this contrast. God has his resurrection, the resurrection of the saints. The devil has a sort of resurrection of those of the wicked in that for five months, none of them die. It's sort of like his mini rapture plan. It doesn't last very long, uh, but that's what he does. And here, when, when we were saved, when we asked Jesus 
to forgive us of our sins, what else did we ask Jesus to do? Live in our hearts. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Thy word is Christ. It's God. It's the Bible. They're all the same. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. So Christ reigns in us, in the heart, four chambers, surrounded by a sea of glass, the pericardium, surrounded by the 24 elders, which are the 24 ribs, and so on and so on. Um, in the absence of Christ reigning in somebody's life, somebody's going to sit on that throne. That throne is not going to be abdicated for very long. And so what I believe is going to happen is that the beast is going to reign literally from the inside out. And you know what's going to happen then? There will be no dissenters. There will be no one. You know, when Hitler ruled over Germany and he took over Poland, he took over Austria, and he started taking Czechoslovakia, moved into France. Did the French welcome Hitler's army with opening, open arms? Here's some wine, here's some cheese, come in, rain over us. Yeah, that's true. They went and hid. Um, the French didn't want him there. They didn't, there wasn't much they could do about it, but they didn't want him there. So you can say that you're ruling over France, but if you're not ruling over the hearts of the people, you're not ruling over them. You may have a gun to their head, and they may be afraid to die, but you're not ruling over them because if you actually ruled over them, you could just speak the word and they would do it. They would do it voluntarily. They would do it freely. And so in any, any time when someone has tried to rule over the world or even, even somebody trying to have total power over a nation, uh, study the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, 1917. They literally took over Russia at the point of a gun and they killed millions upon millions upon millions of their own people to scare the rest of the Russians into obedience. You either serve, you either serve the Communist Party or you die a horrible death. They didn't just shoot them, they took them to camps. And people died in these camps. They're the gulags, they call them. They were horrible places. But I think when the Antichrist comes, he literally is going to reign from the inside, meaning that whatever he desires will come out in the lives of the people that he rules over, and they'll do exactly what they're told to do, and they'll want to do it. Does that make sense to everybody? So, we see a time coming now where man is on the verge. This is getting scary now, very scary. Man is on the verge of having technology melded into man's circuitry, his mind, his nerves, and making man compatible with the World Wide Web, making man compatible with technology so that, oh my goodness, some of us guys are, uh, some of us guys, some of the people that follow our ministry, we keep going to this chat artificial intelligence machine and asking it questions. And I am stunned by what I'm seeing artificial intelligence coming up with. I am just blown away. Artificial intelligence will end up being more human than humans will be. And once mankind merges into that he will no longer have to ask questions of a computer. He will have all of the answers available to him at all times. And, and literally every man, woman, and child will ultimately become part of a giant collective. That's communism, by the way. 
collectivism. That means that you collect all the money and we keep it because we're the government. And then we'll give everybody out a share. And we're already getting into that right now. Um, well, I know I'm blabbering on, but um, the idea came up a few years ago about how AI would have the ability to play the stock market better than any company could play the stock market. And there was an article that came out the other day that an, an artificial intelligence system um, accurately played the market to an 80% um, success rate. In other words, out of, out of 100 investments, 80 of them turned a profit. And they only lost money on 20 of their investments. That's unreal. Okay? And so if you have this machine generating all this wealth, and, and it's taking over everybody's job, well, just give people money every month. They don't have to work, and they can just spend all this money that they get every month. Everybody's going to be rich, and everybody's going to be fair, and everybody's going to have the same amount of money. But you're going to all going to get it be, by being part of the collective. And it's not a good idea. Well, I'm rambling this morning. Y'all pray for me. Anyway, back to the beast out of the sea. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Revelation 13. When it said that in Revelation 11, that the beast rises up out of the bottomless pit and he makes war against them. Who's he referring to? He's referring to the two witnesses. So in verse um, 7 of Revelation 13, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Well, we know here from Revelation 7 that he makes war against two saints, for sure. The two witnesses, whoever they are, and overcomes them. And it says in Revelation 7, he shall overcome them. And it says in Revelation 13, 7, that he shall overcome them. Both places, he shall overcome them. So it's possible that the saints mentioned in Revelation 13, 7 are the same saints mentioned in Revelation 11, 7. But he's going to overcome. Let's say that it's just these two from Revelation 11. Now, remember, these two witnesses, they have power, don't they? What's some of the power they have? Huh? Stop the rain? Yeah. They got fire shooting. They got Iron Man powers. They, got, they can throw fire or whatever. They've got all this power, and yet the beast has power to overcome them and kill them. And their body lays there for, what, about three and a half days? And then all of a sudden, whoom, there they go again. Death is uh, conquered in victory. Um, Revelation 17. When I get done with this lesson, I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to pray. And you pray for me this morning, all right? Somebody's soul depends on it. Somebody's life depends on it. I want to have my mind straight when I get ready to preach this morning. It's an awesome responsibility. Stand behind the pulpit of God and preach the word. Uh, the beast, uh, verse 7. The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman... And of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. What is perdition? It's destruction. Uh, perdition is another word for hell. So he's going to ascend. That, in other words, I think it's telling you, here, here's where he's coming from, here's where he's going. He's going to come, come out of the bottomless pit, but he's going to end up in the lake of fire into an everlasting destruction and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not 
and yet is. So right now, I believe that literally there is the, the, this beast is in the heart of the earth. He is in the bottomless pit, which is under the sea. And he's been held there for I don't know how long. One of these days, God's going to reverse it. He's going to rise up. The pit will be opened. He will come out of it. And when he does, he will begin his 42-month reign of terror on the earth. But I think that the world is going to see him as some kind of savior. Is that kind of what you think? I think they'll see him as some kind of, oh, this is the God we've been looking for. This is the God we want. And I think that's, I think they're going to worship him freely. Um, everybody's got this notion. I read the internet all the time and people are like, oh, that's the mark of the beast. Oh, it's going to happen so terrible. Oh, they're going to make us get it. Um, nobody's going to make anybody get anything. I think people are going to want to worship this guy. They will love him. They will yield themselves to him. They will give everything over to him. Just so they can be part of what he is. He represents a new way, a new religion, a new world order. And uh, did the bell ring? No, no bell? Huh? Yeah, it should have. That's your daughter. Yeah. So anyway, that's what that's sort of my idea of what's going to happen. I think when he rises up out of there, I think the world's going to worship him, adore him. They're, they know they can't conquer him, and they're going to wander after him. But he's going to lead everybody down to destruction with that mark. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this hour. Father, I pray to your God that you would take uh, the weakness of my infirmities this morning. And Lord, make them into true blessings, Father, that only you can do. Lord, may somebody receive uh, edification, education, benefit, a blessing, Lord, from the word that was spoken this morning. And Father, show us things that are behind us, things that are present with us. Show us things to come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.